like to go ahead then and introduce our first panelist. Um, he's actually someone, and this is a cliche, but in this case it's true. Uh, Rob Eggy is a nationally recognized policy expert on Alzheimer's disease. He's the uh, Chief Public, Public Policy Officer and Executive Vice President for Government Affairs uh, for uh, the Alzheimer's Association. He also is the Executive Director of the Alzheimer's Impact Movement. Um, and uh, most significantly from my perspective, because Act for NIH worked with Speaker Newt Gingrich to place the New York Times op-ed, which you may have seen uh, that ran at the end of April. Rob worked directly with Speaker Gingrich and Senator Curry on a panel that came up with a strategic plan uh, for Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease research. With that, let me turn it over to um, uh, Dr. LaFerla, who in uh, December of 2013 was named the Iola Dean of the School of Biological Sciences at UC Irvine. Um, he is a very distinguished uh, researcher. Uh, I am an English major, but I'm someone who's always been fascinated by scientists and their science. Um, his work with animal models, especially mice, has been revolutionary in terms of our understanding of Alzheimer's disease and indeed uh, other dementias. I also have to mention he has a doctorate from the University of Minnesota, but his bachelor's comes from St. Joe's University in Philadelphia, which is actually where my grandfather graduated. So with that, and forgive me for getting things out of order, uh, off we go. So uh, thank you. It's a great honor to uh, be here, and I really want to thank Kathy Eiler for helping uh, put this together. So I'll, I'll be about 10 minutes or so, and I just want to give everyone in this room a little bit of an introduction about Alzheimer's disease just to make sure that we're on the same page. And uh, I guess I'll start with this slide here because one of the first questions that I always get asked by uh, people out in the community is what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And there seems to be a lot of confusion between those two terms. And so the way I like to think of it is think of dementia as a broad umbrella term in much the same way that cancer is a broad umbrella term. If you told someone that you had cancer without telling them what type of cancer you had, whether or not it was skin cancer or liver cancer or breast cancer, that would be an incomplete diagnosis. And I think the same thing is true among the dementias. Dementia is a very broad umbrella term, and Alzheimer's disease happens to be a very specific type of um, dementia. And now that's important because as you can uh, extrapolate from the different types of cancers, if you were a man and you had testicular cancer, you would not want a drug that was used to treat breast cancer. And that's a very obvious example. We've realized that it's different tissues that are affected, different mechanisms of disease, and the same is true for the dementias. And so it's really important that we get uh, support and funding to really understand the different types of dementias because in some cases, drugs that are approved for Alzheimer's disease can make other types of dementias far worse. So this is a very confusing disease, when you, particularly when you go out and uh, try to talk to the lay community. Uh, the people really don't understand what it means to uh, that profound sense of memory loss. And people worry they misplaced their keys, that somehow that, that means they have Alzheimer's disease. And so in, in general, I always tell people that if you go out and you forget where you park your car in a mall, that is normal. That happens to almost every single one of us. So many things impact your memory, including whether or not you had a good night's sleep, if you had too much to drink. Uh, but if you forget that you actually drove your car to the mall, then that's a little bit uh, more extreme. So to try to um, give a good overview of the type of uh, memory issues, there was a uh, HBO documentary that came out several years ago. It was actually quite good. They came to UC Irvine to film a little bit of this, and as well as other universities throughout the um, country. And in this video, you'll see three women at different stages of the disease process. The first woman is the most extreme, uh, so extreme that she's looking at her own reflection in the mirror and doesn't realize that she's, even, that she's talking to herself. And I think it really indicates uh, how devastating this disorder can be. Uh, the second woman is shown a picture of Bill Clinton, and despite very heavy prompting, is unable to identify the former president, and we always joke that she was the Republican of the group. And the third individual just received the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and loses her driver's license. And she just says something that I, I, I think uh, 
really sums up what this disease is about for the elderly. So I, I hope you find this as fascinating as uh, I do. She looks like you. Now, I think she looked like you. She didn't say anything to me. Maybe it takes her time to say something. Oh, I don't know. I'm tired of talking to her through the window. You want to meet her and face to face? No, no. Not today. I told her many of the time, be at your door and I'll be at my door. Mm -hmm. And you know, she had me wait there and she never came out. Look at this. It's a snake. Does anybody have a knife? Where it is. Here. There's nothing near you, Landa. It's not a snake. Yeah, you know, I'm telling you. Right, it's not a snake. You try to make everything simple, but you can't. You can't. I think I can see his face, but I can't think his name. It's Bill Clinton. It starts with Clinton. Not common, huh? Right. Okay. Really, what you all are telling me is that I have lost my independence. So you can see that what we're trying to do here, I think all of the panels are all on the same page here, is that we're asking for support just to make sure that Alzheimer's does not become our reward for living a very long and uh, prosperous life. Now, if you look at some of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, age is the most uh, significant, and I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about that a little later, uh, but there are other ones. So, for example, we know that there are certain genes and family history is a very important if uh, uh, determining whether or not you're likely to get Alzheimer's disease, particularly if your mother has Alzheimer's disease, that increases your odds uh, uh, significantly more than if your father had it. And the reason for that is that all of us inherit our mitochondria from our mom. Uh, we know that head trauma is quite significant. As a matter of fact, if you play football in the National Football League, you have about a 19-fold higher shot of developing uh, dementia. Same thing is true if you play uh, hockey. Almost everyone with Down syndrome goes on to develop Alzheimer's disease by the time they're in their 50s and 60s. Um, the lower your education level, the uh, higher your chances are. Uh, also, we know that obesity is a major risk factor, likewise having high uh, cholesterol, which suggests that certain diet and environmental factors play a role. And also, we now appreciate the impact that uh, stress can have. So just to illustrate how um, important age is, you can see from this slide that one out of every five, uh, 20 people over the age of 65 suffers from Alzheimer's disease. That's 5% of the population over 65. And what's astounding is that number doubles every five years thereafter. So you're talking one out of 10 people over 70, one out of five people over 75, and one out of two to three people over the age of 80 to 85. So essentially, half of the population over the age of 85 suffers from Alzheimer's disease. And in the United States, that's translating to a new case of Alzheimer's disease developing every 67 seconds. A couple years ago, a new case was developing every 69 seconds. And at present, uh, at least according to the association, the last uh, values that we have are about a uh, new case every 67 seconds. So essentially, every minute, someone in this country is developing the disease. And right now, we estimate that there are over 5.3 million Americans, and I think Robert's going to go through and talk a lot more about uh, these statistics, but uh, look at the, uh, if you're not uh, motivated by the um, what's happening on the humanitarian side, look at the economic side, and right now it costs about $203 billion to care for Alzheimer's patients. Um, that number will go up to over $1.2 trillion by the middle of the century, which will represent a significant fraction of the U.S. budget. So it's going to be very difficult for us to imagine how, as a country, we will be able to uh, uh, do, uh, fulfill any of our obligations when we have um, 
such a looming burden to deal with with Alzheimer's disease. So uh, one of the most uh, topical research questions is to try to understand when Alzheimer's disease begins. And what we know is that it almost certainly does not begin the day before you go into your doctor's office and get a diagnosis. As a matter of fact, we now as a field believe that uh, the disease probably begins decades before your initial diagnosis. And that is both good news and bad news. It's good news because it gives us a very long window to try to intervene. The bad news is that we need a lot more research to really uh, identify with precision when those individuals will get, uh, which of those individuals will get Alzheimer's disease and when. And of course, we need to have some kind of therapies and interventions to help those individuals. So our goal as a field is kind of like what it would be for other disorders. Alzheimer's disease is the only disease right now where you actually need clinical symptoms to manifest before you can determine whether or not that person has the disease. And we want to change that. We want to be able to identify individuals before they have memory problems based on biomarkers to say that if you live long enough, you will develop Alzheimer's disease by this point. And think about it with skin cancer. If you have a little skin cancer lesion, you don't need to have clinical symptoms before your doctor can diagnose you as having uh, skin cancer. And so the same thing happens to be true for Alzheimer's disease. Now, one of the questions we get asked over and over again, why an early diagnosis if there is no um, treatment available? And I think there's many reasons uh, for that. Uh, certainly, an early uh, detection is going to be very critical for you to understand what's happening uh, in your life. And even though there is no effective treatment right now, it does allow you to uh, put your own house in order to make decisions and not burden your family members with certain uh, types of uh, uh, you know, life options uh, for you so you can handle your own financial and legal matters and the sooner uh, you're able to do that while you have more of your cognitive abilities, uh, the better. Now I want to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, clinical trials and uh, because ultimately a cure for Alzheimer's disease will only come by through uh, going through clinical trials. And so there was an interesting study done um, a couple years ago where scientists analyzed uh, several phase three clinical trials that happened to be funded by the NINDS over a 10 year uh, time period. And what he found was that the cost of those trials, and these are not cheap to do, was about $335 million. But what was significant was the outcome that came out of it. And this is where money that goes to research, why it's so important, because it's not a dollar in and a dollar out. It's a dollar in, and that gets magnified three or tenfold. And as you can see here, that $335 million ended up leading to about $3.6 uh, billion uh, dollars uh, that ultimately went into uh, practice uh, costs. But it had a very profound effect, and that effect was it led to about an extra 470,000 uh, hours of quality adjusted life for these individuals. So it definitely is having a, a huge uh, impact. And as you can see, that three point, uh, the $335 million gave an estimated uh, health benefit of about $18 billion. And so it's very important that we conduct these clinical trials, uh, particularly for Alzheimer's disease, the better success we have in uh, preventing these kind of memory problems, the higher the quality of life, and ultimately we'll be able to reduce the medical costs for other um, diseases. Now, the sad reality is if you look at the clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease, and this is a study that was published a couple of years ago looking at both phase one, two, and three, what you can see is that as a field, uh, there have been over 400 failed clinical trials. Now, what this means from my perspective is that we should not give up and we have to continue moving forward, and that also means we need to invest more money in research, uh, not less, because it's clear that the only way that we're going to be able to derail this issue is through uh, research. Now, I, I, it's important, a lot of times people get confused between what, you know, what this means. And I want to uh, indicate there is a profound difference between a failed drug and a failed trial. 
And so even though there were 406 trials that did not identify a new treatment, that does not mean that they were a failed trial. So a failed trial does not answer the primary research question. That's different than a failed drug, which does not improve the uh, cognitive ability. Okay, and so I think it uh, really highlights why we need to continue investing uh, in research and um, uh, you know continuing to do these kind of clinical trials. They're very costly, not only in terms of uh, you know finances, but also in terms of personnel. So, for example. Uh, on average, nationwide, it takes about um, three months to recruit a single individual into a clinical trial. So our success rate is about 0.3 patients per month. And so clearly, we need to do a uh, better job in that regard. I just want to leave you on some of the um, research aspects that we are uh, undertaking at Irvine. We're very honored to be one of the 27 Alzheimer's disease centers that's funded by um, the NIH. And you can see from the map where those other centers happen to be. Uh, they are a very collaborative uh, group, and we share a lot of resources with other investigators throughout the United States uh, and throughout the uh, world. And I uh, just want to call your attention to uh, some of the ways in which uh, we uh, study Alzheimer's disease at Irvine, and that is do a lot of lab-based work, either involving uh, human, uh, sorry, involving animal models or human uh, uh, samples, mainly brain samples, but also CSF, so that we can conduct uh, molecular and cellular studies there. And we happen to have some very unique uh, patient populations. So we have the largest uh, group of uh, adults with Down syndrome that go on to develop uh, focal and Alzheimer's disease. And we also study uh, the oldest old and have the largest collection of individuals that are over uh, 90 years of age. And we collect brains from each of those individuals. And uh, all of them like to say that they're uh, donating to us their most precious resource. Uh, which is their brain, and um, an area that I'm really excited about that the NIH has just recently funded for us was to establish the uh, first National Alzheimer's uh, IPS cell bank. So we can actually take skin samples from these elderly individuals and reprogram them uh, into uh, uh, stem cells. So it's kind of like being there when they were born and uh, taking these uh, cells from their umbilical cord and having that capability of uh, differentiating them into any uh, cell type um, in um, uh, the body. Uh, and uh, this is my last slide. I am really appreciative to the NIH for starting this uh, BRAIN initiative, which stands for Brain Research for Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. This is something that President Obama has been very passionate about, and he uh, described in February 2013. Uh, the state of California came up with their own initiative called CalBrain. And the goal of these um, uh, initiatives are to identify new technologies so that we can really understand how the brain is uh, better connected and so that ultimately we can find a cure and treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So thank you very much, and I will pass on the baton to the next speaker. Uh, so, Rob, please go ahead. We'll uh, save questions until the end, uh, but uh, obviously we're most interested in hearing what's on your mind. Thank you. And yeah, I'm going to uh, bring this back to the start. Lots of, on the back, but you might just make it full straight from Oh, I see. I got the camera. I'm one of those unfortunate Windows people. Um, <laughs> Here. So thank you uh, very much for this opportunity. Thank you, University of California Irvine, for uh, for hosting this and organizing. It. Thank you, Pat, for the introduction. I want to give you a very quick tour of this issue from a policy perspective to frame things that way. You've heard about the science. You're going to hear from Leah about um, the uh, importance of what this means in terms of Americans around uh, the country. Here it is from a policy perspective. I'll start with this point that you have heard already. But it's a way to ground ourselves. Alzheimer's disease is a disease that unfortunately has the distinction of being one without any way to prevent, cure, or even slow its progression today. 
So we are still waiting for us, that celebration of the first Alzheimer's survivor. Um, when you look at where the trajectory is, if you look at those 65 and older, um, then it's 5.1 million estimate, Americans estimate today, 5.3 million if we were to include those under 65. And that will increase, we project, because aging is the largest risk factor for Alzheimer's, to 13.5 million by mid-century. So clearly, with the bolus of the baby boomers and the, and, uh, the fact that Americans are living longer, this is going to increase dramatically in the years ahead. And as this has been described, this kind of demographic-based trajectory is baked into the cake of where we are as a country. Um, if you look also at the share of people in different stages of the disease, between mild, moderate, and severe, you also see another uh, important shift that's taking place. If you look at the share that's in the mild or moderate stage, that will uh, retract to about half by mid-century, and that will lead that uh, more and more Americans in the severe stage, which is not, of course, first of all, um, very, very difficult from a human perspective. It's also very costly and intensive in terms of caregiving. And so by 2050, more Americans will be in the severe stage of Alzheimer's disease at that stage than the total who have it today. So that's where we're heading. If you look at the cost, and again, my apologies for going quickly here, we get all these stats, but let these wash over you. Today, we estimate now $226 billion uh, spent on those with Alzheimer's and, and related dementias. That's one fifth of dollars spent in Medicare today. And then if you look at this where we're heading in, in 2050, that's up to 1.1 trillion by our most recent estimates this year, and with a large share paid by Medicare and Medicaid, and the balance by individuals and families. You add that up between now, 2015 and 20, uh, 2015 and 2050, you see the very large share of $20 trillion over this period, with over two thirds paid by federal and state programs, as you know, Medicare and Medicaid, or what we're referring to there. Now, if you look at the opportunity to change this trajectory, though, you have to start with something I'll talk a little bit more in the balance of my presentation. The National Alzheimer's Project Act led to the creation, mandated the creation of the National Alzheimer's Plan, which was released. The first goal of that plan is to prevent and effectively treat Alzheimer's disease by 2025. We modeled one way that might happen the hypothetical that in 2025, by effective treatment, we assumed that was something like a statin that delayed the onset of Alzheimer's disease by five years and modeled what that would mean. Actually, it was a Lewin group that modeled this for us. And uh, what you would find in this scenario is 10 years after that, 2.5 million Americans who have Alzheimer's disease who would have had it, who would have been expected to have it, would not have it at that point. You see that, excuse me for going quickly there, 2.5 million at that stage. By 2050, this gap between what would have been and what is with this kind of effective treatment would be 5.7 million Americans who would have been expected to have Alzheimer's would not have it. So uh, that even a five-year delay leads to these kinds of results. Again, more quick numbers to wash over you. In the first five years after such a treatment in 2025 would lead to uh, decreased cost of care of $83 billion. And if you look at the year 2050 alone, so that one year, by that point, it would lead to $367 million in total savings in that one year over where it would have been. With You can see the proportions here as they break down between Medicare, Medicaid, and out-of-pocket expenses. So that's where we're heading and the promise of where we could be if we were to see, to provide the resources that are necessary to accomplish the first goal of our common national plan. And um, let me then set the stage for the policy discussion with, with this graph. And this illustrates the share of NIH outlays between 1983 and 2013 towards Alzheimer's disease. You'll see here that in 1992 there was an increase to about to that share of 1.78% in 1992, by 2013, it was 1.73%. Pat framed this well. This is basically representing that it's a share of the pie. And the point here is about the size of the pie in this graph. It's about what happens when you're locked into that kind of a share. When the pie increases or decreases, as Pat illustrated, then the proportion that goes to Alzheimer's and every other disease increases and decreases by that amount. What this also illustrates, though, is that it's a challenge that the administration, NIH, and Congress have worked together with us to solve. How do you break out of a, a rigid way of looking at disease when we have that the kind of trajectory Alzheimer's has? 
and create the kind of policy apparatus to thoughtfully address it through the research that's needed. And that's been the program that the NIH, the administration, Congress, and groups like ours have been on since then. And here I want to just end by sketching what this exciting apparatus now in place is and why it matters so much. Just to illustrate that graph I showed you in terms of Alzheimer's disease, to round off the numbers and keep them simple, this isn't quite right, but it was about $450 million in Alzheimer's, a little bit under that, in 2011. And we can basically project that that would stay steady, as that last graph illustrated. It might increase or decrease as NIH would increase or decrease, but essentially this set amount. In 2011, the first step was put in place, Congress passed at the end of 2010, the end of that Congress, the National Science Project Act, signed into law in January of 2011, which set that original scaffolding by requiring, requiring a plan to be released. And with that, then in 2012, we saw the first um, specific way to address Alzheimer's disease in terms of research funding. With the release of the plan in 2012, the administration reallocated uh, funding to provide an additional $50 million in Alzheimer's research, and that was then a way to add to the base. So it would continue thereafter in each year and on to the future beyond where this graph would go if you just project outward and other things didn't change it. So this, in a sense, was the first installment in 2012 of uh, addressing specifically what needs to be done with Alzheimer's disease. 2013, however, started to change this picture. You all know about sequestration and the way that would have impacted Alzheimer's disease as it would work its way down to NIH and then to Alzheimer's, proportionally speaking for Alzheimer's, it would have meant a decrease of $40 million to that base. So in that year, 2013 and thereafter, would have gone away, basically setting us back to where we were the year prior. Um, there was a tremendous act of leadership by Director Francis Collins in that year, where he did something that I've heard described as unprecedented, using his own discretionary budget in essentially its entirety and devoting all of it in that year towards Alzheimer's research to keep things steady for that one year at least, so the research that just kicked off would continue. And uh, that was tremendous uh, in terms of maintaining that early momentum. However, that was not a sustainable solution. We and everybody else recognized the director might do that one year through uh, real leadership. But the lasting solution that's needed, of course, with the responsibility of Congress to appropriate funds and provide resources, is for Congress to engage in this partnership as they did with the passage of NAPA and to uh, push things forward. And that, I'm delighted to say, as this graph illustrates in calendar years, not fiscal years, is what happened in the last calendar year, both in terms of the January uh, funding bill of 2014 and then the FY15 omnibus that was signed into law this past December. Between those two bills, $125 million was specifically allocated for Alzheimer's research to capitalize on the near-term research milestone steps that need to be funded to start to hit this goal by 2025 of addressing Alzheimer's. Now, we have projected that, um, let me just say a bit more, so that then is part of the base and so we'll continue onward. And um, I have illustrated here that in 2014, two of many members of Congress in the House and the Senate who uh, made this happen in this case, um, in the Senate side, two who stand out were then chair of Labor Eight, Labor HHS, Senator Harkin at the time, and the ranking member at the time, Senator Moran, who exemplified the bipartisan way that Alzheimer's has been approached by uh, Congress uh, over recent years. So the question, though, is what happens next in the current calendar year and looking forward uh, with the FY16 funding that's now being contemplated and considered. And to frame up this question of what happens next, I'll wrap up with this, a look at the policy, again, in big picture terms that have been set up in the last few years, which is unique and powerful to address this issue. Uh, first was the passage of NAPA, which I've described, leading to the release of the plan in 2012. That has led to a three-part process. First of all, the NIH and NIH specifically have convened international researchers from around the world, and particularly in the United States, to come together and outline research milestones that are needed year by year to hit the 2025 goal. So there's specificity here you'll rarely see in terms of those year-by-year -year achievements that need to be accomplished. And this, of course, then has to lead to a budget, ideally, and then to appropriations falling on that budget. And that leads to uh, the last thing to highlight, what you refer to as AAA, the Alzheimer's Accountability Act. 
this was legislation that Congress, um, some of the offices in this in this room were uh, tremendously uh, helpful in building momentum behind. It was incorporated into the FY15 funding bill and enacted through that mechanism in December this year. It's now law. And what the Alzheimer's Accountability Act does is it really completes this picture started by NAPA. And what it requires is that the NIH prepare annually a professional judgment budget that answers the specific question of what's needed in the coming year to, in terms of the funding for Alzheimer's research to stay on track to hit this 2025 goal. So it's very specific in what it requires and it asks for. And it empowers NIH to do just that, to, to, to provide this professional judgment budget to inform the budget. And like other professional judgment budgets, what it does is that this budget must be submitted directly from NIH, from Director Francis Collins, as the legislation directs the director to do, uh, directly to the White House and to Congress concurrently with an opportunity for comment from the Secretary of HHS uh, and from a mechanism called the Alzheimer's Advisory Council, uh, directly uh, then in terms of what's needed. And the result we hope and anticipate and are encouraged by the early steps will be the targeted, thoughtful Alzheimer's research that's needed year by year to accomplish this very, very important goal. Um, I know I went at a very rapid, rapid pace, so I won't ask for any quizzes on the numbers I put forward, but you know that between us, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have about these statistics. Thank you. So our uh, next panelist, Leah Drew, is a Chicago native uh, and moved here to D.C. in 2013. She became deeply involved in the work of the Alzheimer's Association following her mother's diagnosis of this dread disease. Um, uh, she has uh, distinguished herself as an advocate both uh, in D.C. but uh, nationally ever since. Um, she uh, also uh, has had a very interesting professional career. Um, uh, she's a graduate of Bates College and holds two master's degrees. But um, uh, we should have bonded over the fact that she's going to run the Marine Corps Marathon this fall. I've actually run six. So. <laughs> um, Leah. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here today to share my story. My name is Leah Drew. I'm a 33-year-old DC resident, and Alzheimer's disease has been a part of my life for at least 20 of those years. I was unaware of it for the first 10 as the disease lay roots in my mother's brain, creating changes that wouldn't manifest themselves for years to come. It wasn't until 2005 when I would receive the call that would change the course of my life. I was at Middlebury, beginning my master's degree. It was a warm night, and I remember stepping out of that chilly library onto the balcony overlooking the quad. Something about plaque buildup and arteries in the brain was all I recall. The tears streamed down my face, and I knew it was the beginning of our long goodbye to mom. I come here today as an advocate for all those touched by this disease the 15 million caregivers providing unpaid support, the family members tested financially and emotionally day after day as Alzheimer's works its course, but most importantly, for those living with Alzheimer's disease who cannot speak for themselves. My story is just one, one of more than five million, only a handful of which are ever heard. When I reflect on the healthy years with my mom, I'm struck by how much her independence and pride defined her. She was no shrinking violet. On the contrary, my mom epitomized Mother Lion. She was active in the Parents Association, ever present at school plays, recitals, and games, and deeply committed to raising us right. In all the years I ran track from 6th to 12th grade, I don't think my mom ever missed a meet always red-faced and screaming her lungs out to carry me, carry me over the finish line. But how could you blame her? It took my parents 10 painstaking years to have children. For an entire decade, my parents watched as the lives of their friends blossomed with newborns and their own seemed to be at a standstill. And then, finally, I was born and five years later, my sister. My mom called us her miracles. Family was extremely important to my mom, in part because of how hard she worked to build one. 
It strikes me as ironic, therefore, that the one disease to which she would fall victim would attack the very characteristics which so clearly defined her. The changes we observed were small at first, a missed appointment, a repeated question, a forgotten date, but soon the paranoia and the wandering set in. She finally received a diagnosis at 63, about a year and a half after I first noticed worrisome changes. One night in particular sticks with me. It was midnight and well after she had gone to bed when I heard her unmistakable footsteps coming downstairs. I followed her to investigate and found mom in the kitchen sorting mail. When I probed as to why she was up, she said she couldn't figure out how to set her alarm, so planned to busy herself around the house until it was time to go to work. A wave of nausea coursed through my body, and I could barely form a thought. I tried to protest, but wound up in tears. Scared and unable to reason with her, I ran to wake my dad, not fully able to express the magnitude of what had just taken place. Ten months later, I was standing on that balcony overlooking the Middlebury Quad. The disease was far enough along that the announcement came with two other crushing blows. Mom was forced into retirement after 35 years at the University of Chicago Hospitals and required to turn over her driver's license. Independence lost, no cure, no treatment, her fate was sealed. The diagnosis sent our family reeling. I was 23, embarking on my graduate studies and getting comfortable into that post-college transition to adulthood. My sister was a tender 18. So, my dad morphed into a superhero, earning him the title Saint Jim around the neighborhood. He did it all, provided emotional support to my sister and I, continued working full time, paying the bills, cleaning the house, schlepping my mom from doctor's appointments to support groups, and ensuring she was safe, sometimes calling her up to 10 times a day before we hired in-home care assistants. Were it not for the support of the Alzheimer's Association, I'm not sure I would be standing here today. With arms widespread, the association helped us to tackle our every need and ensure we didn't have to face this wretched journey alone. From the 24-hour helpline to support groups, we relied heavily on this resource, the only national organization working to provide care, support, and research for families affected by Alzheimer's disease and those living with it. The support my family received there has inspired us to take an active role in advocating for people with the disease. People like my mother, who can no longer advocate for herself. We have worked to raise awareness about the disease. We have participated in association walks, events which raise money for Alzheimer's and dementia research, but also serve to connect all those affected by the disease in the community. But this path has been a tumultuous one for us. Alzheimer's disease affects each victim differently. Some of those living with the disease find a way to make peace with the diagnosis, speaking out, providing support to others, and openly acknowledging areas where they need a helping hand. This is not how the illness played out for my mother. Fight she did, and continues to today, 10 days almost to the day after her diagnosis. But her struggle has been wrought with anxiety, anger, and a relentless unwillingness to look Alzheimer's disease on and say, I see you, and you can't hold me down. I cannot recall a single time when my mom looked me in the eye and said, I have Alzheimer's disease. I actually consider my family one of the lucky ones. For starters, we're lucky enough to have each other. After the diagnosis, friends didn't know what to do or say for that matter, so they sat quietly on the sidelines. When the offers for support and assistance went unfulfilled, it was us. My father, my sister, and I, we just had to make it work. We are lucky enough that none of her accidents leading to ER visits resulted in irreversible damage. We're even so lucky that when my mom wandered from my childhood home on the south side of Chicago with no ID, with no money, it was our next door neighbor who incidentally saw her over a mile away and safely escorted her home. When asked why she left the house in the first place, she said, to buy a 7-Up. But most of all, we're lucky that my parents, both social workers, put away enough money to be able to finance my mother's current living situation in a full-time care facility. $92,000. That's the annual cost for my mom to live in a safe, compassionate, and skilled community. Medicare doesn't cover a dime. So if you do the math, my mom is entering her fifth year in this facility, 
My family will soon have invested over half a million dollars in providing her with a decent quality of life. I can't imagine stepping into the shoes of others I've met along the way. A young woman in her 30s trying to launch her career and care for her mother single-handedly. Or the middle-aged woman who can't afford at-home care and also can't afford not to work, so she's forced to leave her father in potentially dangerous situations worrying all day and sleeping with her cell phone ringer on a high at night. Personally, I think as a nation we can do better. In fact, I think we owe it to ourselves and to all Americans to do better. Today, the disease has reduced my mother to a shadow of her former self. Formerly an active woman, she spends most of her time at rest because walking unassisted has become difficult. Still, she's often found doling out hugs and kisses, sharing childlike smiles, and bopping to Motown music, to which she can still recite every single lyric. She doesn't know my name or out of what reality I appear on visits, but something tells me that deep down she still knows who I am. And even now, after so much grieving and so much brain power has gone into thinking about my mom's illness, it still dawns on me to call her about once a week. That's the hardest part day to day for me. I don't have my mom with me to celebrate my achievements, talk me through my challenges, and advise me on the elements of my life. Every time I stare blankly at my phone, knowing there's no magic number to connect me to the mom I'm longing to talk to, I'm reminded once again about her condition. My sadness and nostalgia are inevitably replaced by the deep frustration I feel about the severity of this epidemic. By the time I finish speaking today, nine more people will be diagnosed with this disease. Six will be women. And though I'm only 33, I am terrified. Terrified of falling victim to this illness, or worse perhaps, having to watch my little sister face the disease. This isn't just an important cause. This is the sixth leading cause of death in America, and the only one in the top ten without a way to cure, treat, or slow its progression. This is the healthcare crisis of our time, and it threatens to obliterate a generation and bankrupt our healthcare system if we don't take action now. I hope my story will help to put a face on this disease, but please remember, my face is one of millions. Thank you. So, thank you for those uh, compelling presentations. Um, I'm most interested to hear from you. Well, if the green light is on, I will yell. Um, I'm most interested to uh, entertain some questions for our panelists. I'm actually personally very grateful that they're going to spend the next two hours with me because I have plenty of questions. But seriously, especially among our congressional staff colleagues, are there questions for our panelists? Please. Uh, first of all, I sympathize. My great-grandfather passed away a week ago from Alzheimer's, so wow. I feel ya. But um, my question is, I'm from the Coalition of Imaging and Bioengineering Research, uh, especially to you. Um, how do you feel imaging is going to play a role, especially interventionally, with this disease? Um, so imaging is already playing an important role right now um, and in two ways. And there are two different types of modalities. There's MRI and PET scans. And so um, there's a lot of active research that's being uh, done right now to bind to two of the hallmark features of the disease. So it turns out that Dr. Alzheimer's himself was a psychiatrist that um, was around in the early um, 1900s, identified the signature features of this disease, which he referred to as uh, plaques and tangles. And so there is a lot of work being done right now to come up with specific ligands that can bind to either plaques and tangles. And, um, and that is being used right now in research, and that's helping to identify that the disease actually, or that these um, you know, uh, structures and uh, changes start to occur in the brain decades before the individual actually develops uh, memory impairments. Yeah, so, any other questions? Please. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Brown, and I'm from the Coalition of Imaging
update to start with comment on the blood test? Yeah, so, and then I'll talk about the policy. For sure, sure, yeah. So uh, as far as I'm aware, there's really no blood test right now that is available for Alzheimer's disease that can be uh, applied to the uh, general population. Um, there are some tests that if you suspect an individual has early onset familial Alzheimer's disease, you could look for a, a gene. So to look at the buildup the, of uh, plaques and tangles, generally that's not done through blood, but that's through, done through collection of uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, that is a very labor-intensive uh, procedure that is not widely utilized for diagnostic purposes, but is only restricted right now to um, for research uh, purposes generally at one of those 27 centers uh, that I described earlier. So, you know, ultimately we want to get to that point where we can help identify who is on that trajectory, but right now there's no such thing. And, and uh, just as a general comment on uh, Gina and its importance, one thing that we're really concerned about is for long-term care insurance that this is an issue where it's not covered in any event under Gina. And that's a big concern because it's one of the few mechanisms. There aren't good ones, as we've heard, um, that are out there. And that mechanism is, is crumbling. And uh, Gina is one more concern that our constituents talk about a lot because if that's on your record, um, that can be disqualifying for long-term care insurance. So thank you for tracking that issue. Uh, another question? Please. Um, so I'm just curious, when So with regard to the first, the brain is perhaps the most complicated um, you know, structure uh, in the entire universe that we know, right? There's over 100 billion neurons in our brain that make over 100 trillion connections, right? Um, and uh, it's also a tissue that is not easily accessible. And generally, people, when they're alive, don't like giving up parts of their brain, right? So it's not the kind of, it's not like your skin or liver or other types of tissue that you could get uh, access to quite readily. So there's an inherent, um, you know, disability or a disadvantage in terms of access to the tissue coupled to the fact that there's so much uh, complexity. So I think that's a significant issue. Uh, also, um, if you look at the end stage of an Alzheimer's disease brain, and um, think about it and uh, how much destruction occurs. If a normal brain weighs about three pounds, at the end of a disease process, an Alzheimer's brain can weigh one and a half to two pounds. So it just shows you how much uh, destruction occurs there. And uh, it's a very complicated process. And unfortunately, um, research is very costly. And what uh, at least the NIA director has said when he comes to the, M to the uh, direct uh, Alzheimer's director's meetings is that the funding uh, has dropped so precipitously over the past decade that we essentially undoubled the doubling of the NIH budget that occurred under the Clinton years. So we definitely need new, I think, investments. And I, I was personally pleased to see Newt Gingrich write a piece in the New York Times calling for a doubling of the NIH budget. I actually think it would be better to triple the NIH budget um, because you know, one of the problems that we are seeing is that Americans don't want to go to graduate school anymore, nor do they want to do postdocs. Uh, and we have lost a generation of American scientists, which I think will take a long time to recover from because they have been really spooked away by the drop in the um, you know, uh, funding. And they're seeing uh, successful grants uh, not get funded. And when you have a pay line at the NIH that is at 
I don't, you know, and I was on an NIH study panel for over 10 years. I don't know how you distinguish a 9% grant from a 10% grant. And what's happening is there's a lot of great science that is going unfunded and uh, a lot of wonderful innovation. And it seems as though for every dollar that's spent at the NIH, it has an economic impact of about three dollars. So you get three times the value for what you put in. So it just uh, is not clear to me why this would uh, not be an, an, an area where a lot more funding would be attracted. You want to add anything? I'll just you know, quick comment about the other part of your question about uh, under 65, and Leah, perhaps you'd like to say something about this too, but for those like Leah's mom and if you saw Still Alice, as I did again this past weekend, um, we know that cohort, we don't know much about that cohort because the observational studies we rely on for overall prevalence are for 65 and older. But we estimate, our best indications are it's about 200,000 Americans, which if you just took that as a zone disease hypothetically, just thought of it that way, would itself be a major, major disease. And that's just those under 65. So uh, we're supposed to wrap up now. I would like to uh, exercise the moderator's uh, prerogative uh, and ask each of our panelists to question that basically um, I'd like to try and leave with some sense of hope. We've heard how difficult the science is. We've heard about the appalling, the immeasurable human uh, cost and suffering associated with this. And uh, Rob has sketched out what it's going to cost our country. What I'd like to ask each of our panelists is if adequate funding is made in the, or, or made available in the research arena, in the patient care arena, and in the policy arena, what is the one thing you do, or what would you like to see us as a nation do to address this terrible disease? Let me start with Frank. Um, so if we had more money, uh, it would be great um, you know, for a research enterprise uh, to really be able to diagnose, um, as I said, decades before well, when you were slated to have memory impairments. Um, and I think that would create an opportunity for us to identify uh, new therapeutic targets and new interventions, whether they be related to stem cells or uh, pharmaceutical targets, that can alter the disease trajectory. And, and that is where most of the researchers in the field are focused right now, is to uh, identify disease-modifying therapies. Not symptomatic, so it's not like treating a fever, but actually getting at what is causing um, those symptoms. And so I, I think that's what motivates a lot of researchers in the field, is trying to identify these uh, disease-modifying uh, type therapies. So it's hard for me to think beyond finding a cure, just having met so many people touched by this disease and having gone through this myself. But from a patient care perspective, if we had more funding, I would want there to be more specific training on how to communicate with and treat um, those living with Alzheimer's disease in hospital situations, whether it's the doctor's appointment or in the ER. Um, as I referred to in my speech, we've had numerous um, ER visits with my mother. A couple of those have occurred when she's been living at the uh, facility where she's at now. They are legally not allowed to accompany her in, a, um, in an ambulance, which means you send a, someone living with Alzheimer's, advanced Alzheimer's, alone on a body board, in our case, um, in an ambulance with loud noises, it's very chaotic, it's frantic, and she's alone. And, and we get a call and then we have to race there and, and deal with staff who have no concept of how to communicate with her, repeatedly asking her questions she cannot answer, she does not know where she is, what is happening. Um, and so I would advocate for more education of healthcare providers in um, understanding how to communicate with those living with the disease the disease in those um, stressful and um, physically and emotionally painful situations. Thank you for that. And then I would um, say uh, on the research side, I, so we're stipulating that so it's hard for me too to get past that point, but just to say compliment Congress, the mechanism was created and ask Congress to so watch like a hawk when the scientists at NIH say what's needed, that that funding's provided. But setting that aside, then also I think dovetailing with your answer, we would like, to, in terms of legislation, to the Hope for Alzheimer's Act, 
which would create the benefit of care planning that would set in motion, as you described, that early support can mean so much to families that are dealing with this. And we want to see within Medicare that the platform set for that support to be provided um, by the association or whoever else to reach out and make those connections. So the Hope for Alzheimer's Act would be what I would answer with. So, so thank you all so much. Thank you for turning out this morning. Uh, thanks to our panelists. I actually had a, a modest parting gift. Um, I was working for Francis Collins during the dark days when the federal government was shut down uh, in 2013. This was at a time when basically the campus was empty. Uh, there were about eight of us uh, basically trying to run the agency. Uh, normally there are as many as 18,000 people on campus. And most disturbingly, we were actually turning children uh, uh, away from clinical trials at the NIH Clinical Center. Francis Collins uh, was deeply upset about this, and he determined that he wanted to have a symbol about what NIH is about. He's a very accomplished guitarist, as many of you know, and we started hand-making guitar picks that said, Hope at NIH. And after all, that's what brought all of us here today. That's what uh, trying to fight this awful disease is about, and that's why the research and the funding to support it is so important. So please, uh, take this modest gift from me uh, and know that uh, what this is all about is hope. Uh, and again, thank you so much for being here this morning.